Ready to go, okay. It's been a long course, <laughs> and you've had to listen to me far too much, so I will be as brief as possibly can. Um, I was asked to try to wrap up and put into context what this course was about, where it fits in in a, in a bigger picture <clears throat> in the scheme of biodiversity informatics. And for this talk, I'm borrowing on one <clears throat> that my Argentine colleague and I gave in South Africa at a georeferencing course that was given by those who had received a georeferencing training course from those who had, had been trained in a previous georeferencing course, a large academic legacy of training in Africa that began in Tanzania. <clears throat> so in the end of this course, we had been asked to also to give some context to why we're doing the things that we're doing and how it fits and how some of the missing pieces of the puzzle that you're not hearing here could be accomplished. So I <coughs> tried to come up with a simple depiction of what it is that we're trying to achieve and where various parts of biodiversity informatics fit into that picture. And it's basically a progression from gathering information at its source and making it usable, and making it useful. And by making it useful, creating an impact. In that progression, <coughs> one can divide these categories up as much as you like, but I like to keep things fairly simple. So I have categorized things at the collecting end, at a management side in the middle, and then the sharing side at the top. And in all of that, in the whole entire progression, there are a couple of things that are constants. One is that at every step of the way, some measure of data cleaning and standards come into play. They may be different at different levels because they're for different purposes. And we saw plenty of how standards come into play. We saw plenty of how data cleaning comes into play within our own context which only basically went this far, from here to here. That's what this course was about. So I won't talk a lot about collecting because you're the experts on that, not me, except to say that the data come from the field and may be accompanied by field notes, certainly by specimens with their labels, that end up in catalogs and that end up being our source for di further digitization. Because after we leave the field, we can't do any more. Once we come into this management realm, we're trying to take care of that legacy from that point on. We've gathered a legacy and we want to try and keep it. We want to try and to manage it for perpetuity and manage it with an idea of making it useful in that direction. And that's where the digitization data capture, all the topics of this course come in to try to overcome our legacy, our legacy of information that we have in a form that is not usable. And georeferencing is sort of a, a level on top of that with a particular purpose of really expanding the integration possibilities of our data with other data that are spatially enabled. I think it's easy to see that from the very outset, having gone and spent effort in the field, uh, spending effort to put those data in a reasonable form, to save it for perpetuity, and to make it more usable more broadly, all of that is always increasing the value and impact of those data. So that's a very broad depiction of what we're trying to achieve with these biodiversity data. And <clears throat> I'll just say a few things about each of these levels. We're in a situation now where much more use is being made of the available information. I told you that in our university, the change between answering emails to give data and allowing others to get data for themselves completely changed the dynamic for the curators, their jobs changed. They ended up increasing the data quality instead of just 
being waiters and waitresses of those data. And what that comes down to is more people are seeing those data, and more people means more ideas, and more ideas mean more use of the information. So it allows us to look back in retrospect. We see the data that were gathered a long time ago, and we lament the fact that they wrote down only the nearest town instead of exactly where they were, because we know that the biodiversity did not occur in the town, for example. So that directs us to ask a question, what should we be writing down? And what I like to do <coughs> is to <coughs> alert you to the fact that there have been compilations of suggestions about where to spend that energy in the field, what to do, what to capture. The museum that I come from has a guide for exactly how to record localities in field notes. That guide is in the day eight folder, and it's called Field Guidelines, something like that. And it's actually a Microsoft Word page that is made to be cut out and pasted into a field notebook, so it's right there with you all the time. So have a look at that. See if there are any useful suggestions in there and make use of whatever is useful. All of the philosophy behind the ideas in this guide come from having looked at our data and tried to georeference it now. In other words, tried to make it more useful in the context of looking back in time because we have received a legacy and we want to make it better and we have a challenge because of how things were done in the past. Luckily, in my museum, we had our first director who was a visionary. This director devised a system for gathering information in the field and codified it and told all of the people under his direction that that is how our museum shall gather information. And what was it? He, his vision was, he knew that the museum would be there for a long time. The museum would be there when he was gone. The museum would be there when everyone he knew was gone. But the specimens and the data would still be there. And so, he also realized, being a director and having to worry about money, that it costs money to go out and get that information. Since that is the case, he said, let's use our precious resources, and when we're in the field, let's gather everything we can. And I don't mean every specimen. I don't mean just throwing things into a bag and saying, look how many we got. No, he's talking about recording the temperature. He's talking about recording what you saw, even if you didn't collect it. You may be a mammologist, but if there's an interesting plant, make note of it gather everything you can and write it in those field notebooks in a way that people can read because in the future someone's going to find it useful. And that's exactly what happened. It happened in many different ways, including historians who have come to those field notebooks. In our museum we have a library that has hundreds of volumes of field notebooks, each with hundreds of pages in them. When we began our digitization project to scan the pages of the field notebooks, our estimate at that point was 100,000 pages of field notes. And now imagine, they're filled with information not only about the collections, the specimens from the time that they were gathered, but about the ecology, about the weather, about how it was the best way to get there, about the price of bear meat, about everything. So it's valuable to historians, it's valuable to collectors, and as it turns out, it's valuable to our museum because now, when we go in there and try to mine the biodiversity information, we find there's 10 times more information about the occurrences of species in there than there is in our own museum. So we can increase the impact of our museum by having made use of a legacy that our visionary director set out at the very beginning. And so we try to continue to use that philosophy today. So that takes us to the next level, which is the level of 
how do we distribute the precious resources that we have to try to manage the legacy that we are creating. So every collection, every inscription in a field notebook becomes a legacy of information. And we, because we're headed in the direction of making it useful, we're headed in the direction of digitization, and we know that that costs money. And this course is really about this area of expertise. It's about turning money through human resources into a precious and lasting persistent resource that can be used over time. <clears throat> and in so doing, we need to have the appropriate tools. We need database systems that are capable of tracking and not <coughs> corrupting our data and making more work for us. They need to be designed for the workflows that are involved and looking forward to sharing. They need to be designed around standards so that those data can be shared. And those standards for workflows are within our own institutions. They might be shared across institutions because it's been determined that there's a right way to do things. In that, way, in that case, there might be standards for workflows across institutions. But certainly when we start sharing those data, in order that we can actually speak to each other with the same language, we need to have standards for data sharing, and that's where the Darwin Core comes in. And you know everything there is to know about Darwin Core, except the fact that I met Darwin in Buenos Aires a couple of years ago, and we had an interesting conversation. Older brother, I hope. <laughs> You're cruel, more and more cruel with time, Tom. That's the nature of the beast. Okay, the goal then, what I'm posing here, is that the goal is data publishing. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that because we haven't really said a very great deal about it. <clears throat> For me, this simple piece of software was a game changer. In the past, we tried various ways of allowing institutions to share their data, and we made interesting networks that were entirely flawed in their basic premises about how data can be shared, about how easy it should be, about the resources required. And so our early networks, in comparison to VertNet now, cost 10 or 20 or 100 times more to maintain per year, even though there were far fewer participants. Each of the institutions had to have their own server, and that server had to be online all the time, and it meant that the institution had to have some knowledge about computers and keeping them running, and had to care about computers suddenly, instead of having to compare to care about the collections. So ultimately, it was a nice experiment. It allowed people to have a feeling of control and a feeling of being a part of something bigger. That worked. But it was actually something for the social side. For the technical side, it was a very poor idea. We overcame the poor idea by kind of going back to basics, saying it should not be required to have a server in every institution. It should not be required to be connected to the internet at all times. Imagine what that would mean here. And it, does, it shouldn't mean that I have to have all the knowledge in the world, just like every one of my colleagues, in order to participate in one of these endeavors. I should be able to do my work. I should do what I'm good at. And sharing should be easy. This tool is part of what changed that game entirely. Instead of having to have servers and be connected to the internet all the time, the integrated publishing toolkit allowed people to take their files and put them on a server that's not necessarily their own and publish them in a way that everyone else can use. And that tool is called the integrated publishing toolkit. I'm not going to go into any detail about how it works, 